this wonderful festival um, trying to rethink and think about what it is to be an artist in the world that we're living in. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background of where I came from and how I got to where I am today. And I'll do a sing a little bit for you, show you a few things, and uh, then we can have questions at the end. So can you hear me okay? Is it a little ringy or is it okay? So, um, it all started with mom. Um, my mother was a singer, and I'm actually the fourth generation singer in my family. My great-grandfather was a cantor from Russia. Um, my grandfather was a bass baritone um, who came to the United States around 1890 and had a career as a classical singer and also had a music conservatory up in um, Washington Heights. And then my mother was a singer on radio and early television. She sang in these kind of variety show formats. Um, it's so weird, it's, my voice is like, is it, is it okay? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of, it's bouncing back, so I'll just keep, keep going. But, um, so my mother, my mother um, sang in these kind of variety show formats where you sang the song of the week but she also sang jingles. Uh, she was the original Muriel Cigar, Blue Bottom Margarine, Schaefer Beer, I mean, these things don't even exist anymore. Uh, <laughs> Royal Pudding. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time as a child in a radio control booth. She sang one commercial, it was a soap commercial called uh, Does Soap, so she was D-U-Z, Does Everything. And she did it every day at one o'clock for a, a soap opera called The Road of Life. And in those days, they didn't have a tape, so she sang it live every day. So I spent a lot of my childhood watching soap opera actors with scripts and sitting on the organist's lap and having to be quiet and everything. So um, music was really, really part of my, of my background. And um, singing was my first language. I sang before I talked and um, it was really something that was taken for granted in my family, but I'm very, very grateful for that. And, um, my earliest training was when I was about three years old in um, a, a discipline called Dow Crows or Rhythmics. Does anybody know what that is, or do some people know? Well, Dow Crows was a Swiss, he was a, a teacher and a musician, and he worked a lot with folk music, Swiss folk music, at the, in the, at the end of the 19th century. And he was also teaching in a conservatory and noticed that he had one student that really was very arrhythmic, like could not read or, or do anything to articulate rhythm. But he watched um, this young man walking and saw that he was very graceful. And he realized that he could develop exercises, physic, physical exercises, to help the young man be able to be much more rhythmic. And so he developed a whole way of teaching that had, um, was very much about music and the body. So um, it, had, it was a three-pronged approach. One was rhythmic studies or rhythmic training that I think he did uh, very close to what the Karl Orff method was with rhythm sticks and different ways of moving to music. A uh, second part of it was improvisation. And the third part was solfege, which is the do re mi fa sol ti do system. So as a little child, um, I, had a, I had, was born with a, a visual a challenge which is called strabismus where you can't fuse two images um, and so I had a little bit of a depth perception problem and so my mother realized that um, I was very natural as a, a musical child but I was not very physically coordinated so she found out about the Dalcros rhythmics and usually children learn music through their bodies but I was learning my body through the music and I loved it and um, I didn't realize how influential that training was for me until I wrote my opera Atlas for a group of classically trained opera singers for Houston Grand Opera. And I was doing um, some rhythmic, you know, some one of my pieces that had is very um, open rhythmically, but then it always comes back to the large cycle. And they were saying, how are you finding the one? Because you're just going, you're going out there, and how do you find the big one? And I said, it's very intuitive for me. And they said, well, that's the Dalcaro's training. And then I realized, it's actually much more of an influence on my work than, than I realized. So that, that was my early training. I ended up, I was doing theater a lot as a child, dance and music. And then I went to 
Sarah Lawrence and designed a combined performing arts program, which was, so I was both in the voice department and music department and the dance department and then a little bit of theater. So during that time, I was beginning to get these glimpses of how I could make work that integrated these elements. It became for me a kind of imperative uh, to be a whole person. So I was making pieces that had some voice in relation to movement and objects and light and um, uh, some theatrical kinds of images um, and made some pieces while I was still there. Um, then I came to New York and I immediately started making pieces, of mostly solo, sometimes duet pieces, uh, and I performed mostly in galleries. Um, it was a fantastic time to come to New York because there was a fantastic revolution going on where artists of different mediums were coming together and actually trying to break through the limitations of their art forms. Um, for example, there were painters and sculptors that were making dance pieces and there were poets that were writing music and there were musicians that were writing plays. And there was a wonderful interchange. It was a real community. Um, and I think for me it was a, a great affirmation of what I had been glimpsing personally. Um, I was very much encouraged to explore and to try to push through to a form of my own. And so that was a very, very special time in, in the 60s. Um, so it was the mid-60s. There was a kind of anything is possible sort of mentality, which um, you know, I, I have so much respect for. And um, this kind of idea of breaking down boundaries. So uh, I began working in these pieces um, that were very much having to do, even at a very early, early time, having to do with place. Because the first piece I did called Break was in a gallery, and I really used the space of that gallery. The, there was a kind of false wall, and I came out into the audience. So I was very much thinking about how does a performance piece manifest in space. Then. Um, Soon after that, I started working with my voice. And actually, I think of my, of my work as a tree with two main branches. One is the deep exploration of the human voice and all its possibilities. And the second one is these, these interdisciplinary or weaving kind of pieces of where I'm, I'm, I'm weaving together different modes of perception. Um, and I think uh, as the earlier part of that was this weaving together of, of what seemed disparate elements in a way to, to try to, as I said earlier, to um, make myself a, a whole human being. I mean, it was really like an inner kind of necessity. But early on, I realized that it had uh, really had resonance in the way that we think about things in the society, because the only culture that really separates uh, these different elements of of performance is the Western European culture, which is a, was a very specialized uh, culture because it was it was built on the um, the uh, well actually you know came during the time after the Renaissance uh, of the uh, Reformation and um, and this kind of idea of logic and um, uh, kind of what would I say um, positivistic way of thinking of the universe um, and so it. Things got to be very specialized and um, and very very precise. So the singers were singers, the dancers were dancers. Uh, you know, I think of, of Louis XIV. I mean, it really was a kind of monarchy uh, model. Whereas if you, if you actually think of other cultures and also what we hear about ancient tradition, um, those elements of music, of gesture, of storytelling. Um, are integrated. So if you think of African culture, Asian culture, and also what we hear about the, the ancient forms of, of ritual. So I think that, um, you know, I think that those implications for me, I, 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 I realized that at a very young age that um, it could be, if, if, if I could make a form that was a kind of poetry of the senses or ways of thinking about different perception, um, that that was a kind of antidote to the fragmentation of our society and that it was a way of affirming the richness of the human being at both the performers and the audience members. And uh, that was a kind of uh, a, a way of, um, it had a, a sense of offering an alternative to what our culture was. So um, that was something that was very important to me. And then uh, I also started thinking very much about um, Space at that time. Um, I, I started by, as I said, working in galleries, but I was uh, thinking in a very frontal kind of way.
way, and even in churches or something like that, you know, pieces like that, and also we're seeing in stages, was a very frontal orientation. And I started thinking about how to break that down and began making pieces towards the, the late 60s that used gigantic groups of people, maybe 100 people as masses in an architectural space and using the architecture of the space as a structure of peace. And so I did uh, large works like, um, I'm thinking of a piece called Juice, that I did in 1969 that took place over um, a one and a half month period. You got a ticket to all three parts. So the first part was the Guggenheim Museum and it had about 100 people in it. And I used also that museum in different spaces had, uh, in different ways. I had the audience at the beginning of the piece down at the bottom looking up and then I had them walking up the ramps and you, you were seeing things very close. And then they were on the ramps looking down and the piece was happening down at the bottom. So this, this idea of what is the relationship between the audience and the performer and how to break down our habitual patterns of thinking about anything, thinking about what a performance is, thinking about the relationship. Um, then a month later after the Guggenheim, there was a little second piece that was uh, took place in, in a proscenium stage, but I really emphasized the frame idea of what that was so that you became very aware of it. And the third uh, piece was in a gallery with no human beings at all, but um, just all the objects that had happened in the other two parts that were, you know, imagine there were like 85 Jews harps and 85 pairs of red combat boots and, you know, all the, the artifacts of those other two pieces were in a gallery in a, in a, uh, in a kind of exhibit. And um, so it, the whole piece became a kind of zoom lens experience. So that was one way I was thinking about also expanding the notion of time, in that you would see that large piece of Guggenheim, you'd come back a month later and you'd have memories of that piece, but some of those images were compressed. Uh, one example, um, the beginning of the Guggenheim, I had someone out on the street riding a horse back and forth in front of the Guggenheim Museum, and then the second installment, in front of the Monolith and Playhouse where we did the second part, I had a little child riding a little rocking horse. And then the third part for the loft, there was a little uh, little statue of a horse in a room that the audience could sit in looking at videotapes of the four main characters' faces. So it always became this kind of sense of transformation. And so that was one way of using time as memory. Another thing I was playing with a lot at that time was times of day that you would perform, like I would do pieces in the morning um, at my loft and make rare for the audience and they would come to the loft. And so you would have your experience at 11 o'clock in the morning and then you would go on for the rest of the day. So I was really trying to think about breaking down uh, notions of what performing is. So right around that time, uh, actually even before that, uh, around the mid-60s, I as I said, I was at Sarah Lawrence and I was in the voice department. I was doing classical singing and doing theater and a little bit of opera workshop. But my early pieces were much more gesturally based and a little bit of a voice. Um, but I was missing singing a lot. So I sat at the piano and I started just vocalizing regular Western European vocal, vocal exercises. And one day I had the revelation that the voice could be um, like the body, that, the, the, that the, the voice could move like a hand would move or like the spine would move. And also that it could be used like an instrument with no words, but that the voice itself was a language. I realized that, that it was a language that was more eloquent than words. Um, and at that same time that I was, you know, that, that, that moment of revelation which really changed my life, I started thinking that the voice also could have gender within it, different ages. Uh, different ways of producing sound, landscape, character. And I felt that also it was a very ancient, ancient instrument. And that it was also a way of me coming back to my family, my singing tradition, but in my own way. So it was a really, really important day. And from that point on, I started working uh, very, very deeply with my own voice. Um, when I was in uh, Sarah Lawrence in the choreography, you know, doing choreography, I had a, some real physical limitations as a dancer, but because of that, I had to find my own way of dancing. And I could find an idiosyncratic kind of language built on my own body and 
that's, you know, from my limitations, I actually found 